you see the metaphors in genesis chapter one are very intentional when it says that he created greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night so what makes the moon for instance a lesser light it is that it does not have light in itself the light that it has is but a reflection from the sun but the sun has light in itself it doesn't depend on any other light source now this is where i am actually going because if god is the sun who are we we are moons look at john chapter one do you know what verse four says he says in he was life and the life was the what do you see the allusion to the moon or not see i am telling you that there are some things in nature that god on purpose created to tell us something deeper about the realm of the spirit and that is why the bible says in romans chapter one he says the invisible things about god are clearly seen in the things that he has created so that man is without excuse so by looking at the things god has created there are some deep mysteries about the realm of the spirit and one of them is what i'm showing you he is the true light that lights every man that comes into the world listen to me in case you did not know it is your destiny to image a spirit you are the moon and you are a source of light god wants to beam his light through you not only is that what he wants that's your destiny that's through you all will see the glory of god can you say loud amen hallelujah praise the lord so what i want to do tonight is to teach and build the foundation i'm, I'm saying some people i can't wait to say hello to when we're done um some of our pastors are here pastor tomiwa from Ibadan. you know i'm i'm surprised he's here because he, we have a project back home god gave us a space like this in a badon yeah, actually you know god is up to something when god said he's our year to occupy he wasn't joking hallelujah so it's good to see you um pastor joshua of benin is, is here it's good to see you pastor emmanuel my name's sick of Uyo is here. Hallelujah. And then, of course, Pastor T is hosting us. Hallelujah. He looks so good, but your wife looks even better. You, you, you guys make love so beautiful. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm so proud of you all. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name. All right. The title of my sermon is Who Do You Image? Who Do You Image? And as a slogan, you can put understanding delegated authority. Who do you image? Understanding delegated authority. I want to start with a Bible reading from Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 14. And it's a text that we all know. You may not know it by heart, but at least you've heard this many times. Because Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And then he prays three prayers. He says that he will grant you according to the riches of his grace, of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in your inner man. That's number one. Number two, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And that you being rooted and grounded in love, number three, may be able to comprehend with all the saints. Everybody read with me. What is the what? With and number two, what is the what? Yes. And number three, what is the what? Yes. Death. And number four, what is the what? And then look at what it says next, verse 19. Everybody read as loud as you can, want to go. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. You hold on. Don't you see how oxymoronic that is? It says to know something that is beyond knowledge. Hey. He's telling you in local parlance that this God, you know, if you see and finish. You see, part of the privilege of theology is to start learning, to have the privilege and the honor 
to start learning what you can never finish knowing. That the 24 elders have been with God in eternity and they are not familiar. They are not familiar. One theologian dramatically put it this way, that probably the reason why they keep shouting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, is that by the time they bow and they raise their head, they are awakened to a new dimension of glory that they never thought existed. And they go again, holy. And by the time they bow in response to that new revelation, by the time they lift their head again, there is yet more. And then they bow again. And by the time they lift, and you, it can take you an eternity. Dalin Zech said in her song, I spend my life to know, and yet I'm far from close to all you are. The greatness of God surpasses knowledge. Amen, somebody. Amen. You know, if you've traveled a bit, you discover that the world is such a massive place, massive place, massive. A lot of land is still yet in uninhabited. And then when you think about the fact that the world is even more water than land. If you've traveled over oceans, you know, that is another world, another dimension on, on its own. The world is big. But then when you begin to see the comparison of the world vis-a-vis -vis other planets, you're not like, what kind of space is this? I took some notes. Do you know if you were to picture the globe, the earth, as a ball, and you wanted to fit as many earths as possible in other planets, do you know how many earths you can put into the planet called Neptune? 53. 53. Oh, you think that's fascinating? Do you know how many you can put in Uranus? Uranus? 63. I mean 63. Do you know how many you can put in Saturn? 764. So now, you think the world is big. Now, think of the other planets, how massive they are. And the amount of space it takes to create that kind of thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Are you getting? So, Uranus, how many? 764. Jupiter, 1,300. See, let me tell you something. The Bible says that day unto day, author's speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There is something about natural creation that gives us some perspective to the greatness of God, the grandeur of God. You see, when you describe it in just words, you don't really get the picture. So what I'm helping you see is so that you can expand your mind and, and, and you think, the person who created this, how big must he be? Are you getting what I'm saying? How big must he be? I remember when I was in a flight from Tanzania and we got to a particular place in, in Kilimanjaro, the place, not the mountain now. And then the pilot said, if you look to your right, you will see the top of Kilimanjaro. And I'm like, what do you mean the top of Kilimanjaro? We are at least 33,000 feet above the ground. You could see clouds. And then in some distance, I could see out of the clouds, something peeping his head. The head of the mountain. Ah, it is true. When the Bible says, only a fool. A fool says in his heart, there is no God. You can understand what David felt. You, you have to be a fool. Huh? I, I'm just looking at the top of that mountain. And I'm like, what? What? The greatness of our God. Say with me, the greatness of our God. Feel free to personalize and say the greatness of my God. And just in case you thought Jupiter was big, you know how many Earths you can fit into the sun? 1,300,000. See, that small ball, you see. <laughs> this entire planet, you will need 1,300,000 to fill it with the Earth. We're just starting. And then, science tells us that there are 
100 billion planets in our galaxy. In just, did you hear what I just said? I'm trying to expand your mind to, to imagine the space. I didn't say there are 100 billion planets. I said there are 100 billion planets in this galaxy, the one we are in. And so, what will it take to come out of our galaxy, to come out of the Milky Way? So, first and foremost, you're going to have to move with the speed of light. You know how, how fast light is? Now, what is the highest speed you've driven? <laughs> or oh, maybe the, 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 the fastest you've been in any vehicle? Who can tell me? Who wants to volunteer to tell me? What's the fastest? 120? Really? 140? Ah, well, I know they move. Anyway, it's good. <laughs> How is it measured? 140 watt per watt? Kilometers per hour, right? Now, you can remember how fast that felt. Think about 300,000 kilometers per second. How fast that would be? That every second you have gone 300,000 kilometers. How fast? That's the speed of light, right? If you were moving at that speed, it would take you 100,000 years. See, when we talk of, see, when we're talking about the size of the earth, you, you can't compare it to anything you can see. So at the speed of light, it will take you 100,000 years to enter another galaxy. And that galaxy may be bigger than this one. Are you beginning to get a glimpse of this? Come on, Auntie, are you beginning to get a glimpse of this? So when Paul is saying, so listen, if what God made, you can, science cannot finish searching it. How much more the God who made it? You can't finish knowing him. If what he has made, you, you can't travel around it. You will need, you will need a million lifetimes. Are you getting a glimpse of this? To know what surpasses knowledge. Come on, are you with me? To be filled with all the fullness of God. That is the privilege. That in this school, there is no graduation. This is not the kind of course you need four years. For this one, 100 years will not be enough. A thousand years will not be enough. A million, after a billion years, you would have just started scratching the surface. Are you getting what I'm saying? But it will still be worth it because the knowledge is a privilege. Are you getting what I'm saying? And to compound that, some days you skip without reading your Bible. <laughs> when you go learn, do <laughs> To search the unsearchable. To describe the indescribable. I think it was two or three years ago, I was preaching in Port Harcourt, where a lot smaller than this. And I was teaching on the holiness of God. And what I was trying to describe to you is that even if when a lot of people talk about the name holiness, they think about it in terms of um, moral attributes. Or moral uprightness. But when you talk about the holiness, holiness of God, holiness has to mean something deeper than that. Because if you say God is holy, are you saying God is morally upright? Like, okay, God is not trying not to steal, not to lie. Are you getting what I'm saying? There has to be something deeper. Or case in point, when the Bible says that Mount Sinai was a holy mount, Are you saying the mountain is morally upright? It has to be something deeper than that. Something greater than that. 
When the Bible tells you that the utensils in the Old Testament temple were holy, it cannot mean moral uprightness. So what then is holiness? Amongst every other thing, holiness means excellence. Come on, are you getting what I'm saying? Excellence. The word means that which is other, meaning you have what is general and what is common, and whatever stands out is holiness. So if in an exam, everybody gets 60 and under, but you, you get 90-something, only you, that's holiness. Because nobody is talking you. Some of you who had classmates who were holy in academics. That's what holiness is. Excellence. Something that stands out. Something you can't describe. And that's who God is. Listen, in trying to describe God, the moment you say God is like, you're already wrong. We don't have to wait for what you say next. Whatever you say next is wrong. Don't you understand? Because when you're talking in natural terms, there are some things, we, we, we even have figures of speech, like simile, uh, because there is some similitude. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when you want to describe red, you can say red like roses, red as scarlet. But how do you describe God? You don't have enough vocabulary. You don't have the frame of reference. There is nothing with which you can describe God. There is no Elohim like Yahweh, none. That's why the Bible says, who is like unto you, O God? Amongst the gods, who is like you? Glorious in what? Are you getting a picture of holiness now? Glorious in holiness. Meaning even in holiness, you excel. Do you understand? Amongst things that stand out, you stand out. You can't describe him. So how do we know what is beyond knowledge? For us to know God, God must step down. (laughs) You see, the people who think they can make heaven by their efforts, you have to be crazy or you're you're just ignorant. There are even some men who are so great, so lofty, that you cannot know them until they reach out to you. Are you getting what I'm saying? Just imagine you want to you want to know the King of England. If he does not want to know you, you can't know him. That's the thing. So God had to step down, reach reach out to us, primarily by the incarnation of Christ. But even deeper than that, God allows us now I'm going to use a big term and I'm going to describe it to understand him with anthropomorphic attributes and I will explain what it means that fancy word simply means the attribution of human characteristics to God so hold on let me break it down for you since God is spirit and he dwells in unapproachable light You can't know him. You can't approach him. You can't access him. So he reaches out to you and he wants to reach out to you in relatable terms. And so one of the ways he does that is through what theologians call anthropomorphic attributes. Meaning he uses the things that man can do to describe what he can do. So for instance, the Bible tells us that God has eyes. Amos chapter 9 verse 3. And God has ears. Daniel chapter 9 verse 18. God has hands. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 25. Verse 25. So when the Bible wants to tell you that God can reach you, he describes it in terms of hands because that's what we use hands for. Are you getting it? But that's not literal. God is spirit. But now he uses human attributes to describe him and what he can do. I'm heading somewhere. This is important. And I just gave you that fancy word so that if you hear it somewhere, you know you've heard it before. There is another term that describes one of the ways that God can be known. The first, let me see if you can call it. The first I said is what? Oh, you're doing well. You're doing well. Number two is theomorphic attributes theomorphic 
theomorphic attributes. And this one is simply the conception of something in form of a deity. Now, this time around, it is not the conception of a man in form of deity. It is the conception of anything at all in form of a deity. And what I am telling you is this, that there are some things on the earth that God on purpose made to be, at least in a symbolic way, a picture of his greatness. There are some things on the earth that God puts to explain his greatness. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 19 from verse 1 to 2, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. It says, day unto day author speech and night unto night shows knowledge. Meaning when you see the heavens, there are things about God that you can know. For instance, don't forget the introduction. When I'm talking about how great space is, you now think that the one who created this must be even greater. Are you getting what I'm saying? Uh, so that's what, what the psalmist is saying when he says the heavens declare the glory of God. And that's theomorphic because by the things that are created, you can know how big God is. God did it on purpose. Think about it. There is every, not every possibility. Now, science is looking for another civilization. There is no such thing. The only thing you will find are spirits, angels and demons. We are the only ones on the earth. So why did God create 100 billion planets in one galaxy? It's just like building many houses that will never be lived in. So why did he do it? Just to let you know he's big. So the next time you think he cannot provide your next job, think about that. Think, just remember that. He has houses that people will never live in. Just there. <laughs> You don't know how big your daddy is. Are you beginning to grasp it now? Do you know how wealthy daddy is? So that's how big he is. And I'm heading somewhere. So when I tell you that you can fit in 1.3 million earths in the sun, and then you go to the Bible in the book of Psalms, chapter 84, verse 11. And of all the things that the psalmist is using to describe God, look, look, I want you to see what, how he describes God. Psalm 84, verse 11. Everybody read with me, want to go. For the Lord God is what? Hold on, look at that. Just the first one. The Lord God is a what? Leave shield now. Now, what for you? Are you cold? For the Lord God is a what? Now, does it mean that literally? No. This is theomorphic. He's using something natural, inanimate, to describe God. The Lord God is a son. So, when, so first and foremost... Having described some things about galaxy and, and how big the sun is, you, you get what he's trying to describe. This sun. And when I tell you, man, Mike, Ty Mike Tyson is a liar, you don't start thinking, oh, that means he lives in the jungle. No. That's not how metaphors work. He's talking about some particular attributes. In this context, his bravery, his ferociousness. So when we say the Lord God is a son, what, what's he trying to describe? I will talk about some few things. Number one, he's letting you know that God gives illumination. God gives illumination. If the sun is so big and so far away, how come it still lights up this entire world? Because it's, it's, that's how great... That gaseous ball is. Gives illumination. It was C.S. Lewis who described something. He experienced something and he used that to, to, to write something um, poetic. 
because he was in a barn in a farm. He was in a, in, it was a farm, a barn in a farm. And there was a small hole through the roof. Some of you have experienced this before. And when the sun was shining, there was now a ray dropping into the barn. Before, before that happened, the barn was dark. So when the ray came in, two things happened. Number one, he saw the ray. And through the ray, he saw everything else. So when we say God is light, God is the sun, not only can we see him as light, but in his light, we see all things else. Do you understand what I'm saying? So he's letting you know that God's light is our worldview, is our perspective on issues of life. Listen, he's not the one who killed your relative. He's not the reason your mom is sick. He's not using sickness to try your dad. God is not tempted with evil, neither does he tempt anyone. Are you listening to me? Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. Is that in your Bible? You may not have known all the Greek words or the Hebrew words, but this is a conclusion and a conviction that you must hold to eternally. God is good. Always good, only good. Listen to me. There are some questions you may not have the answer to until you see him. There are some things. Listen, maybe now you hear me talk about this and you come and say, well, if it's good, why did this happen to me? I may have the answers, I may not. But I know one thing for sure. God is good. And listen, all things work together. All things work together for good to them that love God and to those who are the called according to his service. That when Joseph, who had the dream, finds himself as a slave boy in Potiphar's house, listen, they stripped him of all his raiment, put him in, on a platform, and they prized him like an item. The one who dreamt. And now he finds himself as a slave boy. God was still good. Are you listening to me? See, the fact that you read to the end of the story, and now you know that God was good, does not mean the stories you don't know the end. God was not good. So the stories that are concluded, you know what Paul says, Romans 15, 3. He says, the things which we are written aforetime were written for our learning. So that we, through the patience and comfort of scriptures, may have hope. So the story of Joseph gives you hope. It tells you that even if I don't understand everything, I may not be able to see all that God is doing. Because you see, from where he stands, he has a better perspective. Are you getting what I'm saying? All I can see is, uh, I can't see far beyond my, where my feet is, is walking. But listen, God is good. Always good. Only good. Say that with me. Say, always good. And only good. Anyway, I have to move on. That's not where I'm going. Now, number three, God is consistent. Listen, there are people who are good men today that may not be good men tomorrow. You know that, don't you? And that is why even if you have the liberty to choose who you will marry, please choose with God. Because the fact that you found the right person today doesn't mean he will still be the right person in 10 years' time. Don't people change? Man is not God. Women are not God. People change. And most people get married, for instance, to people who have not really touched money. You can never know someone's true character until he has money. People change. When people are hard pressed, they've gone through life, they can morph into something else that will make you surprised. Not every woman knows how to handle tr pressure. Not every woman will give birth to two children and remain the same. Are you listening to me? So the fact that God is good 
it is also important that you know that he's consistent. And so the Bible tells us in James, I think, chapter 1, verse 17, it says, every good and perfect gift comes from above and from the Father of lights. Hey, you see that metaphor there? Amongst all the sources of light, God is the Father of lights. He's the Son. He says, with whom there is no variableness, meaning he does not change. Come on, are you with me? He's consistent in his goodness. He's good in Nigeria. He's good in America. He's good in Kenya. He's good everywhere in the world. With whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. You know, and I've taught on this before, and just in case you've not heard me say this, I want to rush through it. You know, we were told in elementary science that the sun rises where? In the east. And sets where? In the west. But as you journey in science, you discover that the people who say that only mean that metaphorically. Because the sun does not rise, the sun does not set, the sun does not move. The sun is constant. So why does it appear that the sun is rising and setting? It is because our planet moves. And this is a very powerful picture that on the times where it seems like God is not consistent, you were the one who was inconsistent. You know the reason why if you go out now, there is no light because there is darkness? It's not because the sun is not shining. It is because our planet has backed the sun. That's why. But the sun is shining. And God is always faithful. If you come to me, if you draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to you. So everyone who experiences darkness backs the sun. But God is always good. Only good. Thank you, Jesus. I have to move fast. This is just the introduction. But are you being blessed? This is point what? I'm about to enter. Four. Look at Psalm chapter 19 verse 6. By the way, Psalm 19 is the same um, psalm that starts in verse 1 by saying, uh, uh, day unto day, utter speech, and night unto night, the heavens declare the glory of God, right? And in verse 6, he now talks about the sun, so we are right by using theomorphic attributes in relation to God and the sun. He says, it's rising from one end of the heaven and it circuits on the other. He says, and there is nothing hidden from his heat. Come on, are you listening to me? There is nothing hidden from his heat. So now, he's telling you just like the sun, there is nothing hidden from God. He knows all things. Come on, are you with me? You can deceive the person by your side, deceive even your pastor. Thank God for prophetic gifts. But uh, there, is, there are some times that, uh, you know, God humbles us, he reminds us that we are human. And someone will be lying, you know, hi, my God. Allow me to use African metaphors. You know, have you seen people lie for no reason? For no reason. Just make up stories out of thin air. It, it, there, there is a dimension of lies that works with creative miracles. <laughs> that, that you just, you just, phew. There's a guy I almost got arrested. He's asking a girl out in our church. He wants to impress her. And because I've seen, uh, I'm a public figure, I take pictures with everybody. You just stand, you snap pictures. So he has a few pictures and some things. And now he wants to impress her by lying that we are very close. <laughs> yes, for some reason. If it's that, I don't mind. Every popular person experiences that. You know? There's a tough man of God in this country. Someone called him. He said, how are you? Fine. Nothing else. Why did you call? He said, I just wanted to tell my friends that I know you. You know? <laughs> you know? 
If I'm ever reluctant to give my number, you get why. You don't understand. You know, one girl was playing with one boy in her office. I think they liked each other at the time. I don't know. None of my business. You know, so, so you know, all those friends, stop it, stop it, stop it. <laughs> Do you? None of my business. So the guy now said, I will report to your pastor. She now said, report. Take, report. So he carried her phone and called me. A guy I've never spoken to before. And so just imagine my busy schedule. When I see a call, I'm thinking maybe someone is at the point of death, needs prayer, needs counseling, you know. So I pick the call. I hear a girl in the back. Hey, give me my phone. Give me my phone. And the guy's like, hello, hello, <laughs> hello. <laughs> they laugh like fool. <laughs> hello. <laughs> I, told, I told her I will call you. I told her. I've been through a lot. <laughs> Hallelujah. So this guy formulated a lie. He said, I persuaded him to invest in a business. He invested 30 million. They did not pay him back. So they're owing him 30 million. That, so even if you want to lie that you know me, can't you lie something good that I... Ah, we attended the same school. Or um, he's my distant cousin's neighbor's friend. <laughs> so, so, now I hear the girl begin to suspect. So, uh, so, pastor asked you to invest in a business. 28 million. It went like that. You are still a member of the church. You have no... So, uh, what will I do? Uh, he's pastor now. The girl begin to suspect. So she asked someone. So we had to call him somewhere. So yeah, repeat what you said. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> Hallelujah. All I'm saying is this. And listen, please, please, before you fall in love, imagine she married that kind of person. Don't ask me to you and they pursue each other for garden. <laughs> Open your eye, investigate. Are you listening to me? Is she all right? Open your eye, investigate, check well. Please, are you listening to me? Hey, liars, they all. And you want to make sure you don't get to heaven to know all the truth. The one you can find, find. And the Bible says that all things are made bare before him. That there is no part of the earth that is beyond the reach of the sun's heat. Say loud, amen. amen. Come on, I said say loud, amen. amen. And all secrets will be revealed. The ones... Who claim to be pastors and are not, all secrets will be revealed. The Bible says in the last days, everyone's work will be manifest. And guess what? Liars are terrible. Do you know that you can get so used to lying? On that day, some people will still try to deceive God. <laughs> Have you, haven't you read Matthew 7? They said, some will say, uh, we cast out demo, devils in your name. They, you won't deceive God, join. Do you understand what I'm saying? These are outright false teachers and magicians. They are so, you see, pathological liars. They want to lie to God. We did it in your name. As if he doesn't know all things. Depart from here, I never knew you. God is the son. Say loud, amen. amen. He sees all things. And then the final thing I want to talk about is that he's self-sufficient. Because there are other sources of light that are not self-sufficient. There are lesser lights. You see, the metaphors in Genesis chapter 1 are very intentional. When it says that he created greater light, 
the greater light to rule the day and the lesser night light to rule the night, right? You've read that before, right? So now, what makes the moon, for instance, a lesser light? It is that it does not have light in itself. The light that it has is but a reflection from the sun. Come on, are you getting what I'm saying? That is the source of its light. But the sun has light in itself. It doesn't depend on any other light source. For the light that it emanates. Come on, say amen if you're following this. Amen. Now, this is where I am actually going. Because if God is the sun, who are we? We are moons. And I am explaining delegated authority. Oh, are you listening to me? And so now there are texts that you've been reading that never really stood out to you that will stand out to you now. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Come on, you know John chapter 1. In the, from verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. It says, same, The same was in the beginning with God. It says, All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Do you know what verse 4 says? It says, In Him was life. And the life was the what? Do you see the allusion to the moon or not? And that life was the light of men. In case you think that's not convincing in love, look at verse 8. He talked about John, John the Baptist. He says, John was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness. Oh my God. Are you getting this? This is important. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. Verse 9, that was the true light that lighted. Oh my God. Are you getting it now? See, I am telling you that there are some things in nature that God on purpose created to tell us something deeper about the realm of the spirit. And that is why the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, I think verse 20, he says the invisible things about God are clearly seen in the things that he has created so that man is without excuse. Come on, are you with me? So, by looking at the things God has created, there are some deep mysteries about the realm of the spirit. And one of them is what I'm showing you. He is the true light that lights every man that comes into the world. Listen to me, in case you did not know. It is your destiny to image a spirit. It is your destiny. You are the moon. And you are a source of light. But like Jesus said, the light that is in you can be darkness. And again, the title of this sermon is, who do you image? Who do you image? Because God wants to beam his light through you. Not only is that what he wants, that's your destiny. That through you, all will see the glory of God. Can you say loud amen? amen? You see, when Jesus sat on that well, just imagine it. The Samaritan woman came casually to fetch water like she did every normal day. Not knowing the person that she had just met. And Jesus looked at her and smiled and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is talking to you. Come on, are you a me? What if God beams his light through you to a degree that your life becomes a gift of God to everyone who encounters you? That anyone whose life comes across yours, the person's life must change. The person's life must be blessed. Because the true light has lighted you. Say, that's my destiny. In case you did not know, that's the real meaning of sonship. You see, when we talk about sonship, when we say Jesus is the son of God, we mean four things. Like I said, I want to teach. This is deep. It's called deeper for a reason. Deeper is different from apostolic visit. You must hear word. Amen, somebody. When we talk about the... the the sonship of Christ, we're, talk, we're talking about at least four things. Number one, the fact that he's born of a virgin. When the, when the angel told Mary that she was going to have a child, and she said, how shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? Now, this is, 
this is the response. He says, the power of the highest will overshadow you. This is how the conception will take place. He says, because of this, therefore, that holy thing shall be called the son of the highest. Why is it called the son of the highest? By the virgin birth. Because no man was responsible for his birth. So the sonship of Jesus describes the virgin birth. Are you with me? But then in Hebrews chapter 1, when the writer of Hebrews says, to which of the angels did he say, this day have I begotten you? Referring to the resurrection. In Romans chapter 1, he says that he was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. So the sonship of Jesus also talks about the fact that he was begotten from death. He rose again. So the sonship of Jesus describes the virgin birth, describes the resurrection, but it also describes delegated authority. And don't miss this. When Philip said in John chapter 14, show us the father and he suffices us. He said, have I been with you so long? And you don't know me, Philip? He says, do you not know that he that has seen me, Kasombre stapale, resongra leku prastiga. Oh, are you with me? And just in case you were thinking that that is exclusive to him alone, well, you're right in some context. But don't forget, he said, he began to talk about the Holy Spirit. He says, and in that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and you in me, and I in you. So the same way that Jesus images the Father, we are to image Christ. Come on, are you with me? By the way, this is what it means to be made in the image of God. It doesn't mean you have a nose and God has a nose. It doesn't mean you have an ear and God has an ear. It is a position of status that on the earth you are his representatives. That because you are here, nobody will look for God. That if anybody like Philip says, show us the father. You say, don't you understand? We are ambassadors for Christ. Did your Bible not say that? To wait that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. He says, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. He says, therefore we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God doth beseech you by us. That is imaging. That's what it means to be the moon. Media team, put it up so that they can see it. Second Corinthians 5.20. Now then, everybody read together, want to go. Now then, we are what? As though what? We implore you how? Listen, listen. So everywhere we go, it is on Christ's behalf. That's what it means to be a moon. It's on Christ's behalf. Hey, we didn't send ourselves. We didn't sponsor ourselves. We come in the name of the Lord. What a mentality to say we pray you in Christ's stead. Meaning it it is as though Christ came. Don't you know what it means to be an ambassador? If the ambassador of a nation makes a request, that nation has made the request. That is what, that's the privilege of being an ambassador. He defends the interests of the host nation. The interests. That's your calling. To defend the interest of God on the earth. That's why you're here. And if you don't know why you're here, you will live a petty life. A meager life. You are too easily impressed. You have a nice car and you think you have arrived. Car? Car? Some of you, secretly your biggest ambition is to drive a type of car why are you so small don't you know that it is a mind like you that created that company that same car company are you getting what i'm saying how did your mind become so small that a person like you has a car company and your life goal is to have one of his cars You are more than that. If you don't know what it means to image God, 
your life will be petty. When people look at you, please let them see more than how much you have. You see that foolish canal culture that is built around possessions, built around oppressing others because of financial acquisition. It choke, it choke who? <laughs> Listen, just in case there are some of you that God has destined to be social influencers, don't copy that foolish lifestyle. Are you listening to me? Your life is not to choke anyone. Nobody should feel horrible about their existence because you are blessed. You are blessed to be a blessing, not to oppress. You are not blessed to impress. You are blessed to be a blessing. And that is the kind of pressure that pushes people to fake life, projecting what you are not. You just see some stories online. You know, there's a member of our church. He went online and he saw one of these celebrities posed with his Mercedes and, and announced it that he's a new whip. He didn't know what to do, so he sent it to me. He said, Pastor, what should I do? I said, just DM her, benefit of doubt, because they live in the same estate. You are a child of God. Just tell her respectfully, please bring down my car. <laughs> this is not they told me. I, I, I saw it. Guess what? Someone would have seen that thick picture and felt oppressed. Ha, hey, I don't have bands. Do you, you know, be our own. Don't kill yourself. <laughs> don't kill yourself. Ah. And if car is a show of your wealth, you are poor. <laughs> you never see money. <laughs> you, know, you, you don't know what's going on. Listen to me. Because it is your destiny to image God, to project the spirit, you are a projector. If you don't project God, you will likely project something else. It is not only nature that abhors vacuum. The realm of the spirit abhors vacuum too. You are destined to project. Guess what? I think I've taught on this before. Listen very carefully. You see, the enemy is an imposter spirit. He tries to imit imitate everything that God is doing. So the reason you have the mark of the beast is because there is the mark of Christ. A lot of people don't know that the mark of the beast is an imitation of the mark of Christ. That the real mark of Christ, the Shama in the Hebrew, what Moses, you know, was it Moses or Joshua now? I think Joshua told God's people, he says, the law of God, write it on your forehead and write it on your palm so that you don't forget. It's called the Shama. The law of God. So it is people whose foreheads are vacant that can carry the mark of the beast. You, ha you're, you're, you, it, you have to be vacant to carry that mark. You were vacant. The enemy came and found space. That is the problem. That's the real issue. Are you getting what I'm saying? In Genesis chapter 3, after man fell, and God was giving the decree and the prophecy of the future, he said, I will put enmity between the woman and the serpent. 
and between her seed and its seed. Listen, I'm sure you know that the serpent was just an actor. It was the devil. Come on, you know that, right? Well, in deep theology, is the adversary, but I don't want to make the differentiation. That one is advanced. And we know that spirits cannot marry, spirits cannot reproduce. So why is God saying that the serpent will have seeds? Good news, or news flash. He wasn't talking about the serpent literally. He was talking about the people that will image the serpent. Because the serpent too was being inhabited. And so, you see, there is some language you don't understand when Jesus is talking in the Bible. And he sees people, Jesus and John, and they say, brood of vipers. He's telling them, I know what you are. I know what you are. Because now, the seed of the woman, Christ, is here. Everyone that opposed him as prophesied are the seed of the serpents. And Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said, you are of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. Are you seeing the connection now? Just as God had sent Jesus to image him, these ones were imaging the devil. Some of them didn't even know. Some of them didn't even know. And you see, if you are ignorant, spirits can, you, you can just be, you just look at Peter, one minute, he image Christ, another minute, he image Satan. He said, you are the Christ, son of the living God. Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this. Let me tell you something. Not every utterance is ordinary. Don't you understand? There are some people speaking to you. They are not speaking by natural inspiration. That is why you need to know when to reject things. Don't be so nice. That, do you understand what I'm saying? You are no more righteous than Jesus. Sometimes you need, you need to recognize when it is Satan talking through people. You are going about what God asks you to do. And someone will just come with bad mouth, gutter mouth, and start sowing discouragement. And what you were excited about, now you are down through. Don't you recognize? That's the enemy. Listen to me. I'm teaching spiritual warfare in, in, in types and shadows now. See, when the devil himself was tempting Jesus, the Bible says he left for a season. When he was done, he left for a season. So where else was he tempting Jesus? Through people. In the wilderness, he came himself. Other times, he came through people. Every time he was tempting Jesus in the wilderness, what did he say? If you are the son of God, do this. If you are the son of God, finally, Jesus is on the cross. The people down, what did they say? If you are the son of God, come down. Isn't that familiar? Isn't that familiar? If you are the son of God, come down. Come down from the cross. Or you thought that was a coincidence? He tried to use Peter. He can use loved ones that allow him. And if you allow it, they will derail you. Are you listening to me? (laughs) It is not only in Nigeria that real estate is scarce. In the realm of the spirit, real estate is scarce. And so if you are vacant, I'm not joking. Do you know what it means for for Jesus to ask a demon, what is your name? And he says, legion, for we are many. Have you calculated the number of a legion? It's it's like the battalion of an army. Some people put the number at around 3,000. How can one person be walking around with 3,000 spirits? Do you know how many people are 3,000? Then all of them, just imagine all of them entering one person after the other. If you know get eye, you go marry that one. <laughs> and you think you have two children. No. <laughs> you are many in your house, in your family. 
<laughs> because in your father's house there are many mansions. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Who do you image? I'm asking you a question. That's not rhetorical. Who do you image? Thank you, Jesus. That you may be conformed to the image of his dear son. Conformed. Thank you, Jesus. God has anointed me to do great things. God has anointed me to do sing God has yeah, yeah. And Kai. Sing God has yeah, yeah. Kalamandri Kapoya. I'm thoroughly furnished, say, I'm thoroughly furnished, yeah, with wisdom and power, yeah, I have resources, oh, to do what he says, I'm thoroughly furnished, say, I'm with wisdom and power. I have resources resources. to do what he says. Sing God has anointed me. Copalataya. Sing God has. Yay. Kalamande Rebayai. The true light has lighted you. Sing God anointed me. Come hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kalaman de repaya. I'm thoroughly born in say. Compra satire. With wisdom and power. Hey, I have. Myself to do what says Leparakaya. I'm thoroughly born in Seya. Yeah, Kopro Sotera Bahaya. I have resources to do what he says. Sing God has set a kepaya. Resete ke pele toko presete, rete ke pele toko presete, esete ke pele toko baya, eset toko pendele ko pele tokida, embresete ke baya, shete ke pele toko baya, rete ke pele te, sete ke pele te kebe, rete ke pele te kebe, rete ke pele te kebe, siki tiki tiki tiki. One more time. I'm totally furnished. Kai, let take a belly compress that tire. Prendele belly take it. Reteke belly tire. Do you lack resources? Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. To do what he says. Please be seated and speak in tongues. Speak in tongues. Sepele takai. Rasete keba.
Thank you, Lord. Listen, if you want God to do much of your life, you must learn to image him. And when it comes to imaging God, there is a protocol for imaging God. And it is not something you have to guess about. The Bible tells you how. It tells you, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He says, he, even though he was in essence God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He says, but he laid aside his privileges and humbled himself unto death. Let me tell you something. If you want to really image God, you have to look beyond yourself. Sometimes your privileges, you put it aside so that you can serve. You know, when the Bible was talking about the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, he said something. He talked about Moses. He had to abandon the fleeting riches of Egypt. Moses was Pharaoh's adopted son. But his destiny, come on, are you with me? Was to side with the slaves. It means to fulfill destiny. You cannot be about convenience. You can't be about convenience. If you're about convenience, you will miss it. It takes a lot of conviction to side with the slaves. He didn't hold on to the fleeting riches of Egypt, sided with the slaves, was banished with the slaves. You leave the palace where you grew up to go into some wilderness because you had the burning bush encounter. Well, that is how greatness is made. Are you listening to me? That is how greatness is made. You're going to have to look beyond yourself. You're going to have to look beyond yourself. Even if you are Esther and you have security, you side with the purpose of God. Are you listening to me? You side with the purpose of God. There is every tendency that God's people were going to be judged and Esther maybe at least for a while would have been saved. But she didn't do that. She didn't do that. She recognized that she was in the palace. For a time as that. So now, you are seeing your privileges as not something to flex over, over those who don't have. But you are, you, you are seeing it as a platform God gave you for the sake of the less privileged. You know, no matter how bad this nation is, there are some people who won't feel it. But we know you are imaging God when you are able to feel the plight of others that share a, 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 that have a world experience that you never have tasted. The Bible says, remember those who are in prison as though you are in prison too. It says, mourn with them that mourn. Rejoice with them that rejoice. Listen, this is the elementary version to imaging God. You have to start feeling. You have to start feeling. You have to learn to be moved with compassion. Your culture has doused that sensitivity to the plight of people. So you have, to, you have to renew your mind and get it back. Get it back. You know, even the states can be rough. If you grow up here, you have to learn to be a fighter. Unconsciously, you are ready to fight. You are aggressive. But listen, as you learn the word of God, that sensitivity is preserved. Do you understand what I'm saying? That softness is preserved. You can see people suffering and you feel what they feel. I'm telling you, it is the moment God repairs that, that thing that culture has tried to damage, you will start hearing him. You will start hearing him. You will start hearing him. And that's when God will be giving you visions that are bigger than all those petty ones that you had. Petty ones that you had. Petty ones that you had. You know, the Lord has told us as a ministry to build a free school. I don't know where the resources will come from, but the God of CCI, watch. It will be done. And I'm telling you that to inspire you, your life can be worth more. Imagine if your wealth was not measured by your possession, but by your contribution. That people can stand up and be counted amongst lives that you have touched. That is how to make a meaning of your life. You know, there's a young man that inspires me so much. Even though I'm, I'm, I pastor him. So blessed. So blessed. So blessed. 
It was his birthday. I asked one of his workers, what can I buy for him? The, unconsciously, the person started laughing. Because this is how blessed he is. He said, sir, I don't know what to tell you. His co-workers came together and bought him a G-Wagon for his birthday. There are different types of buses. Oh. <laughs> Do you know the kind of boss you have to be for your workers to come together and buy you G-Wagon for your birthday? If you think it is only pastors who are blessed like that, you are wrong. Some people have carried their mantle to the marketplace. I'm telling you. And when I was talking to him, here, here what do? Listen, this is someone you can almost never tell what is worth by looking at him. Only by his contributions, the lives he has touched. When his, quote unquote, sons buy him G wagon. Is that not... Is that not a different dimension of wealth? Imagine two people are bragging. One say, I have G-Wagon. You say, oh, you bought a G-Wagon. My sons bought a G-Wagon for me. They are not the same. They are not the same. You know what he told me? He said, I've given out 68 cars. You know the year which I did. <laughs> Even me, ah. He said, I've given out 68 cars. So it was a blessing to see my people buy a car for me. 68. Your life will count. That when you stand before God, may a nation be behind you saying, God, he did us well. We We are the results. See, we are here. He blessed us. She blessed us. That is how to make your life count. Come on, are you with me? Sometimes, when I see the way God is reaching the world through me, sometimes I wonder what if, just what if, I caved into pressure and did not obey God. Do you know how many people talk to me out of this, try to talk me out of this? How many relatives said all sorts of things? What do you mean God has called you? You want to be a burden to your parents? They said all sorts. You will fulfill your mandate. I came here to tell you, you are an ambassador for Christ. He says, as though God doth beseech you by us. So when you step into nations, it will be recognized as the gift of God to that nation. In your vicinity, you'll be recognized as the gift of God to that vicinity. So listen, you have to embrace the mentality first. And start morphing into that person. That is, that is how to start living. You know, when the Bible says, for instance, about young ladies, he says, let your beauty not be in external adornments. Do you know that there can be a deeper beauty about you? Those things are good. But listen, make sure that there is more to you than your physical looks. Guys, make sure there is more to you than your dressing, the car you drive, the money you have. If a woman falls in love with you just because of money, you are of all men most miserable. I'll never forget, when I was doing my MBA, I gave one lady, a classmate, a ride. So, I, we're talking in the car. A married woman. And one thing led to another. She said, ah, that if her husband does not have money again, which kind of love is that? I thought she was joking. I looked at her. She said, you can't love a man that doesn't have money. I'm wondering, this man at home, does he know the kind of person that God will help you? But can you blame her if that is what he put forth when he was asking out? was it? They had a deal. They had a deal. What if God sent you here on an errand? When he checks what he wrote about you before the foundation of the earth, does it line up with what you are doing now? What are you doing with your life? Thoroughly furnished 
with wisdom and power. I have, yeah. Sing it again, somebody. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I've been searching my heart if to share this with you or not, and I'm going to. What does it mean to be an ambassador for Christ? And what kind of resources back you? You know, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 82 verse 1, it says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty and he judges amongst the gods. Listen, a lot of theologians struggle with this. Who is he talking about? Oh, maybe he's talking about the Trinity. No, God cannot be amongst the gods. That cannot be referring to the Trinity. And so when you study this and I have sermons on this, you will discover that God actually gave and assigned angels to be in charge of some territories. And that is why you have principalities and powers, you see. So those rulers of darkness, they were actually holy angels that fell. Do you understand what I'm saying? And they corrupted their power. And that is how come you have the prince of Persia, a wicked prince. God initially apportioned some nations to be under uh, the, the rule and the control of some angels. And according to this text, they judged unjustly and they were partial to the wicked. And so God said, I have said you are God's, but you shall die like men. Are you getting what I'm saying? This is him judging these spirit beings. But listen, this is a principle. It means that everyone that is sent on behalf of God, 
in many instances, special instances, they present themselves as though it was God presenting himself. And Jesus said, if he called them gods, to whom the word of the Lord came, and the scriptures cannot be broken. The people who go the extra mile and go the other extreme, and they say all Christians are gods. That's not what the Bible says. But there are some people who are given special duties at a particular time, and they go with such a backing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Listen, God is the son, and he likes to delegate authority. Always, even before he created man, he delegated authorities to the angels. And that is why he said, let us make man. Why is he telling them? It doesn't mean they were co-creators. It means that they were, listen to this, in the image of God. It didn't mean that they looked like God. It didn't mean that they were saved. It means that the same way man is in charge of the natural creation, the angels were in charge of the spiritual creation. Do you understand what I'm saying? God had delegated space to them and now he wants to do on earth what he had done in the realm of the spirits. And that's why the Bible says that when he was creating the earth in the book of Job's, that the morning stars sang for joy. Follow this closely. So God had always wanted to delegate authority. See many instances in the Bible. You see, in the council of the mighty, God will say, what do we do? And some spirits will suggest God had always had this communal um, perspective. Do you understand what I'm saying? He, he likes to show off his greatness in his sons. In his sons. In his sons. I can show you instances in the Bible where angels were called sons, but that's not where we're going to. He likes to show his greatness in his sons. And listen, when anyone sent in the name of God goes, they can make decrees as though it were God. What did God tell Moses? He says, see, I have made you a God to Pharaoh. Look at that. A God to Pharaoh? And so you now command a level of backing, a level of the supernatural. Come on, are you with me? It becomes supernaturally natural to the extent that when Moses was in front of the Red Sea, God said, why are you calling to me? Stretch your hand and divide it. I've given you liberty. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can become so backed that everything is with ease. See, alignment is a powerful thing. You cannot stop a man who is aligned to God. You cannot. You cannot. You want to see the supernatural? It is first by alignment. Before praying, you see, Praying when you're not in the will of God is a waste of time. Find this will and do it. When you go to where God sends you, you are a God in that place. I'm telling you. Do you understand what I just said? And the resources of heaven back you up. Think about it. Because when it comes to imaging God, it's, like I said, it is not look. Anybody that the word of God comes to can act in God's stead. A donkey can rebuke Balaam. A donkey. And even an angel can tell Zachariah, because you doubted what I said, you will not speak again. See, so, so, why? And you are wondering, how can an angel judge a prophet like that? Well, he didn't come in his name. Did you hear what I said? And that is how come in the Old Testament, are you ready for this? Sometimes you are wondering, was it God or an angel? God is using them interchangeably. Don't you understand? Because when God sends you, it is as though God went. That's what it means to be an ambassador. How do you stop such a person? How do you stop such a person? He said, when the Lord sent Israel, Jacob was his sanctuary. He says, the Jordan saw it and fled. The mountains keep like rams. And then the journalists began to inquire, what ailed the old Jordan that you are turned back? Or old mountain that you skip like rams? And it says, tremble, O earth, at the presence of God. Imagine what your life would be, come on, when you go with God. When you don't just go with trends, you sit and you say, Lord, what is your plan for my life? That template, what have you written? 
Don't you understand? The Bible says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you have created all things for your pleasure. They are and were created. When you decide that your life is for the pleasure of God, you sit and you say, Lord, lead me. I have gone in my own wisdom. It has not led me anywhere. You'll be amazed what God can do. My path crossed with a very great man today. A billionaire. He said, I've been following your ministry and I wanted to ask you, how is it that you were able to do all this in a short time? I said, I'll be honest with you, sir. It is election of grace. Oh yes, I'm hardworking. Very hardworking. But it is election of grace. You want to enter into what the Bible calls effortless rhythm of grace. Find what is written about you. Come in the volume of the books. Are you listening to me? And watch grace carry you. So that in truth you can sing with wisdom and power. Come on, are you listening? I have resources. I didn't send myself. I'll give you one more chance to declare. I'm thoroughly furnished. With wisdom and power. I have resources to do what he says. Listen to me. When the Lord blessed Isaac, are you listening to me? When Isaac blessed Jacob, he gave him corn and wine. How do you do that by laying hands on someone? Listen, the capital you have been trusting for, God wants to give you now. Did you hear what I said? You are thoroughly furnished with wisdom and power. God brought you here. This is your burning bush experience. You are here to discover destiny. God is sending you. Thoroughly furnished and complete. Everything God has said you will do will be done. Did you hear what I said? Everything God has said you will do you will be done. I'm thoroughly furnished. Yeah. I have resources. Stand to your feet and declare it. With. Yeah. I'm thoroughly furnished. With wisdom and power. I have resources you can already sense that this deeper is your deeper you will not live the way you came come on sing and totally for the sale with wisdom and power I have resources you are a man of God listen to me waste this time at all tonight before you sleep speak in tongues and declare God has anointed me to do great things I will walk in line with my call I will deploy all my gifts I will bury my talents in the ground everything that God has destined for me to be I will be as he is so are you in this world Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. 
Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We declare that we are who you say we are. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let everyone receive unusual clarity in their assignment. In the mighty name of Jesus. Listen to me. There is someone here. That burden you've been carrying. The Lord said, open your eyes. There is a ministry there. What you have been carrying as a burden. God is going to use you as a testament of his power. To bring people and use people in spite of pain. The Lord is asking me to tell you, don't be distracted. Don't be distracted. There is a message in the mess. All that you have gone through has qualified you to console some people who would have told others you don't know what I'm going through. You can tell them confidently, I have been through it. Been there, done that, got the t-shirts. I am an eternal witness of the faithfulness of God. For it is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance, uh, that God saved Paul, the chief of sinners. In this meeting, you will see the glory of God. I said, in this meeting, you will see the glory of God. I said, in this meeting, you will see the glory of God. The Lord is asking me to tell someone, this is for someone. Your sins are forgiven. God has brought you here to repackage you for destiny. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. God has brought you to establish you on your feet again. I insist, says the Lord, your destiny will still be fulfilled. Yeah.